Dr. Lynn Patrick, how are you? Andre Fatou, I am well. Thank you for inviting me. I'm uh, honored to be part of your uh, large network of uh, listeners and viewers. And well, I would, I really, ha I really have a lot to talk about with you. So I'm happy to be here. Well, I'm honored to have so you on I board and to be attending your conference. Uh, September 6th to 8th in Santa Cruz, California, uh, the EMF right. conference. Uh, first, tell me a little bit about yourself. You told me you're not an EMF expert, but you're a naturopath with four, yeah. years, four years of training. No, and I'm learning. Like many healthcare providers, I'm learning. So I'm uh, in the United States, as you do in all provinces in Canada, you have licensed naturopathic physicians who've gone to a four year residential accredited medical school and then graduated with a license to uh, practice medicine. So we have that same thing in the United States of America in 22 states now, 20, 22 states, uh, where we go to a four-year residential medical school and we learn standard medicine along with um, what we would call alternative or integrative medicine. So we learn homeopathy as well as nutrition, um, uh, physical medicine and uh, botanical medicine. And so that's how we practice. 20 years ago, uh, literally 20 years ago uh, this year, I began a postgraduate course in environmental medicine. And that was uh, as a result of listening to a lecture by my mentor, Dr. Walter Crinian, who unfortunately just passed away this, uh, this year, uh, three months ago. How do you start? Uh, in environmental how do you I spell, beg your pardon? How do you spell his uh, name? Walter Crinion, C-R-I-N-N-I-O-N. -N so he was considered a global expert in environmental medicine. He was one of my mentors. Um, and so uh, after this year-long postgraduate program, I was so convinced that environmental exposures play a large role in health conditions. Um, most of our chronic diseases that I changed my entire practice. I was uh, basically practicing in Arizona as a primary care uh, physician. And in Arizona, naturopathic physicians have uh, literally the same scope of practice as primary care providers. So we prescribe medi medications, deliver babies, do minor surgery, et cetera. I switched my entire practice to an environmental medicine practice. And I moved to another state, uh, coincidentally, uh, and began that practice in a multidisciplinary clinic with uh, physicians, nurses, uh, acupuncturists, et cetera. Uh, as time went on, I became more and more involved in the teaching of environmental medicine. So I have lectured for several uh, major uh, national medical member groups in the United States, and I've actually lectured quite a bit in Toronto. So I teach environmental medicine in Toronto, Canada as well. So you must know. Uh, as Yes, absolutely. Yes, you have a really good group of environmental medicine physicians in your province, but specifically no, in the... I'm in, in Quebec. We don't have many oh, here. Oh, Quebec? No, no. Oh, okay. So Quebec. You right. have to travel. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, you need to go to Toronto and enlist some, some docs to come and live in Quebec. Or Ottawa. So, yeah, so time goes by, you know, 20 years goes by. Um, I began to uh, teach more and more with a gentleman named Bill Ray, who is originally, as you know, a cardiothoracic surgeon, mm -hmm. who both his children and himself were pesticide poisoned. And he was seen um, by a Theron Randolph, who was one of his predecessors. That's Dr. Ray in the middle. Uh, we lost Dr. Ray in August. Uh, he died uh, suddenly. Uh, and uh, he became one of my mentors as well. Now, Dr. Ray has a clinic in Dallas, Texas, the Environmental Health Center. And Dr. Ray, as you and I were speaking about, started in 1991 to recognize, identify, and start treating patients who had been exposed to uh, radiation frequencies. You know, back in those days, we didn't have the kind of... Um, frequencies that we do now. So these were folks who had been occupationally exposed, who'd worked in the military, on radar, <clears throat> et cetera, or in industry. 
And so he began to, to do that. His two colleagues there, Dr. McCarter and um, Dr. Summers, who are on either side of him, not, well, they'll come back in a second, uh, have, have worked with him for decades and are carrying on his practice. And they're both going to be speaking at our uh, EMF conference mm -hmm. in September. I'd like to tell uh, you Bill, how, how I met him first. Uh, I, please. I, I, I wrote a lot about uh, housing for the chemically sensitive. I met a, a chemist who worked at County of Mortgage and Housing Corporation. Her name was Virginia Solares. Two of her daughters had MCS, multiple chemical sensitivity. And mm -hmm. through her, she was in charge. She managed all the studies done by this federal housing agency on indoor air in, in houses. And even they published, they even built a, a prefab house for the chemically sensitive. They had people test materials. They published a guide on how to select building materials for the chemically sensitive. So uh, I was speaking to a lot of, for, for about 30 years now, a lot of people who were very sick in Quebec and elsewhere. And uh, uh, I met even a surgeon in Montreal who was treated in Dallas at the Environmental Health Center by Dr. Ray. Uh, he came up to Montreal at the Royal Victoria Hospital for a conference he gave. And uh, another time I met him in 2015 in Brussels. And I asked him, how did you keep your license? Because the Texas government wanted to strip him of his license. So they investigated, they called him a quack, like a lot of people tried. And I said, how'd you keep your license? He said, well, they investigated and I was right. And he smiled. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, what we are finding now, you know, and, and you can see there, if you scroll down just a little bit on that website, you'll see that what Dr. McCarter is finding and what she's speaking on is the intersection of two very difficult to treat, and I would say almost epidemic exposures, that of EMFs and mold. Yeah. And uh, we know from some of the research that's going to be presented at the conference by uh, some of our European colleagues that those who are exposed to mycotoxins from uh, water damaged buildings and mold growth are much more at risk for uh, being sensitive to EMF and EMR exposure. So I'll go back to April of this uh, year, 2019, Dr. Um, Bill Ray was speaking uh, at our conference, the Environmental Health Symposium, which is another environmental medicine conference I run. When was that and last he came, year? This was in April. Yep, in April of 2019. We have a big uh, national, uh, uh, actually international, environmental health symposium conference. I'm sorry, you came mean up, 2018 because he passed away last August. He, yeah, he passed away in August of this year 2018 yeah yeah, yeah. sorry 2018 yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty ensconced in 2019 if you can tell so in 2018 in yeah. April of 2018 he came up to me and he said I really need you to help me put together a conference on EMF exposure because there's going to be a rollout of a 5g frequency and it will be devastating um, so he knew all about this so, of course, I was honored. I said, yes, we started working on it. And he gave me a speaker list of pretty much all the people that you're going to see here. His colleagues, he had been going back and forth, as you know, uh, to the bioinitiative meetings mm -hmm. in Brussels. <clears throat> and with these, uh, Olio Hansen, Magda Havas, Dominique Belpom, Pilar Munoz Calero, Gunnar Hauser, and all these clinicians and researchers uh, have been looking at the effects of EMF CMRs uh, for the last decade, and their research actually was given as testimony to the EU and has been um, kind of the, some of the foundation of some of the policies that the EU has enacted. So what we did is we continued, um, uh, my colleagues who were helping me organize the conference and I continued and we are now putting this conference on. So Dr. Kalpana Patel, who was Dr. Ray's right hand uh, physician, I don't know, uh, maybe because you're on the East Coast, 
of the Americas, you know, about Love Canal. Do you remember Love Canal back yeah. in the 1970s? So Dr. Patel was one of the physicians who was actually active with those families at Love Canal to help them understand both the sources of exposure and the devastating effects of their neighborhood being built on top of a waste dump. Um, Dr. Patel has been uh, working with Dr. Ray both to uh, research and write up her findings. She is one of the co-authors on Dr. Ray's two now four volume series of works on chemical um, uh, sensitivity, environmental medicine, uh, immunosensitivity, et cetera. So I'm really looking forward to her being there. She's going to be wonderful. Um, so we're not just talking about the devastating effects of EMF CMRs. We're really going to be teaching healthcare providers how to identify and treat both with avoidance strategies and remediation strategies. I want to also uh, let you know about my co-chair. So Dr. Lisa Naj, she is on the East Coast. I don't know if you know Dr. Naj. Yes, I haven't um, met her yet. I'm, I'm very excited to, to meet her finally. She would be great to interview. So Dr. Naj was an emergency room doctor who became mold uh, exposed through a leak in her home, uh, became extremely ill, and was treated by Dr. Ray. Uh, in the course of her mold-induced illness, she also became extremely EMF sensitive. She couldn't really be in a room where there was Wi-Fi. She couldn't use a computer. She couldn't hold a cell phone. So she really was electrosensitive, and as a result of her um, she had a couple of near-death experiences. She actually had a stroke as a result of this. Really? Uh, she's uh, completely healed. Um, she is really probably one of the more passionate advocates for, uh, with the United States government, actually, with NIEHS, for the recognition of environmental uh, exposure-related problems. So for, you know, in, in your world, uh, people who are chemically sensitive or multiply chemically sensitive are much more at risk for sensitivity to exposure from Wi-Fi and cell phones and computers, right? Excuse we, me. We know that. That's actually, so, go you, ahead. You mentioned she had a, a link with the U.S. government to recognize EHS? Yes. Yes. She has worked with the Department of Veterans Affairs. She's worked with the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, which is a sub-agency of the National Institute of Health. Mm -hmm. She's actually put on a program for the federal government on this issue uh, through NIEHS. Um, she'll tell you about that. Some of that is viewable on the web. And so she's uh, probably one of the great leaders in bringing this information, not only to uh, more standard medical societies, uh, because she was part of the standard allopathic medical um, uh, practice for so many years, um, as well as really trying to uh, create policy for recognition of this within the federal government. So I'm very honored to have her as my co-chair. She would be a wonderful person for you to interview, and uh, I can we can make that happen if you choose to do that. Um, I have learned... As, Go ahead. As you know, it's so important, this recognition, because everyone quotes the World Health Organization saying that it may be in your head, it may be ergonomic right. or reading. Uh, people are looking at the psychiatric aspects. Uh, right. Scientists say so yes, they, it, is, it is in your head. It's neurological, actually, that condition. No, it's not. I mean, certainly, it's one of the not. physiological effects of environmental exposure is neuroinflammation right which can cause depression but this is but uh, chemical multiple chemical sensitivity is extremely physiologic yeah. and biochemical and dr bell palm who is going to be one of our speakers has actually published work in this area i don't know whether you're familiar with his research but he's yeah. looked at both a group of patients who are uh, multiply chemically sensitive and a group of patients who are emf electrosensitive, EMF, EMR, electrosensitive, and he's found very similar biochemical um, biomarkers in their blood that, that are um, uh, reflective of a serious inflammation. 
So Dr. Balpam, I think he's going to be, he's one of our keynotes. He's a very interesting gentleman. He's an oncologist, a PhD MD oncologist. He has his own hospital. Um, he is the head of the uh, French Association for Research on Treatment Against Cancer, which recognizes chemical environmental exposures as a major cause of cancer. So he actually does research in this area. But the reason we're bringing him here, besides the fact that he worked very closely with Dr. Ray, is that he is looking at the blood and brains of uh, those who are electrosensitive, as well as those who are multiply chemically sensitive, to start identifying exactly where the damage is, and furthermore, how can we identify these patients? So he clearly lays out, as a result of his research, here are the lab tests, here are the scans we need to do, and as you know, Andre, in the country of Sweden, due to Dr. Johansson's work, and he's another one of our speakers, Electrosensitivity is an accepted by the federal government of Sweden, an accepted diagnosis, and it qualifies for disability. And so in Sweden, electrosensitivity is a very well accepted uh, diagnosis and a disability. And so and Dr. Johansson, who's been researching in this area for 40 years, he was one of the first people in the world to recognize that um, radio operators and radar operators got rashes, right? So I, I don't know if you've seen this research, but he worked in this area with the Karolinska Institute, one of the most prestigious research institutes in the world, to really start understanding this. Now um, he, he doesn't work there anymore. He's an independent researcher, and he really is uh, spending most of his time traveling globally to talk to standard physicians about his finding. Uh, I think that he's probably one of the global experts in the, the, not only the signs and symptoms of exposure to EMF CMRs, but the actual medical science of how we're going to identify this. Because I can tell you myself, I teach doctors, that's what I do for a living now, I'm not in private practice. Mm. Very few. I mean, I could count them on one hand, <laughs> the doctors in this country that understand that exposure to EMFs and EMRs can lead to skin rashes. One of the most uh, obvious and common signs of effects. I'm not just talking about radio sensitivity, but the effects of EMFs and EMRs. You know, these rashes are usually just treated with cortisone, steroids, and sent away. Uh, and, and these are the folks that are going to be much more at risk for developing all kinds of sequelae, including cancer, as a result of them, their EMF, EMR. So I'm really looking forward to Dr. Johansson's, not only his presence there, because he's going to be participating in several panels, but his latest research. He's going to present his, his latest research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I met him also in 2015 in Brussels at the MCS EHS conference Dr. Belpam organized. It was a fantastic conference, and I have video interviews also online of, of those. I should maybe show uh, on our YouTube channel, Maison Seine. It's, it's French, of course, we're based in Quebec, but when you go down, uh, we have Dr. Hardell also. Uh, I interviewed oh, him. wonderful. We tried to get Dr. Hardell, but he was unable to come. He had another pressing. The latest uh, video I just did here, Dari, Dr. Barry Breger is a uh, family doctor who's battling to keep his license in Quebec. He treats with vitamin. Yeah. For 40 years, he's a, he's a specialist in, in uh, orthomolecular medicine, and uh, he's about to lose his license. And he diagnosed this woman with EHS because they have tons of antennas just one floor on the roof above her high scale uh, penthouse uh, in uh, a heritage building on Nuns Island off Montreal at the bar actually if people go on our on this channel and you click on playlist you'll see at the bottom the uh, Brussels fifth Paris appeals conference with all the, the people I interviewed here um, Wonderful. And I believe Dr. Ray was there too, wasn't he in 2015? Of course, of course. He gave a great And there's Cindy Sage next to Dr. Belpom. Yeah, exactly. 
And um, here's Dr. Ray. I remember one of the things that struck me is when uh, Dr. Ray, I saw an article and I spoke to him about this. Hi, I'm Dr. Bill Ray from the Environmental Health Center in Dallas. The triggers, Hi. I was asking him about the EHS triggers, and he was telling me that about 80% of his patients were hypersensitive to chemicals and electricity and also to mold. Uh, it, yes. So either or both were triggered, uh, either by chemicals such as formaldehyde, uh, solvents, pesticides, uh, mold, uh, m carbon monoxide, uh, concussions. Uh, yes. So people don't realize uh, medication. Sometimes he told me, uh, the, 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 t talk to me about the metal implants, Stephanie. And Carter knows about that a lot. He told me I was one of he was one of the worst culprits because he was a surgeon putting in metal implants into people's chests for many years. And now he's- And you know, it's, it's okay, Andre, because he's made up for it in yeah. spades. Because, because he's I, actually helping those patients get explanted. Yeah. So uh, just for those of you in the listening audience to uh, talk a little bit more about this, just so you know what we're talking about. Um, we are subjected on a daily basis to many chemicals in our everyday exposure. Some of us are more reactive or sensitive to them than others. And Dr. Ray has, uh, through his 40 years of research, been able to help us understand why. One of those reasons is because we, uh, our barrel gets full, basically, what Bill used to say, is we have a, you know, our body is a barrel, and when we have so many toxicants in that barrel that we can't excrete, uh, we can't uh, biologically uh, metabolize and excrete, then we start getting sick. What we're starting to understand is that some of us are more genetically predisposed than others are to not being able to handle this. Yeah. Some of us have um, uh, more inflammation, more oxidative stress than others do, and that's a factor as well. And some of us just simply have more stress, and I'm not talking about chemical stress, I'm talking about emotional, psychological stress, which also adds to that body burden. Bill was a genius in being able to actually identify, quantify, and assess these body burdens, as well as being able to eliminate them. Now, what we're gonna learn at the conference is exactly that from these experts. How do we as healthcare providers learn to identify these exposures? What are the tests that we need to do? How are we gonna know if people have mold exposure? What kind of the tests are we gonna to need to do? How do we identify this? And how can we then help them? And this, you know, we have to give Dr. Ray credit here because he was more than anybody in, you know, as the, the giants whose shoulders we stand on, clearer about this is we have to start avoiding and minimizing exposure to these toxicants. So what he had, as I just explained to you, is a very large uh, kind of day hospital where patient, patients would go, where their exposures would be minimized, and they'd start getting better, right? And so that process of teaching doctors to assess, to uh, um, basically analyze and diagnose, and then treat is going to be the focus of our uh, three-day conference. That's I what think it's important to stress also, Lynn, it's important to stress to physicians that Dr. Ray saved the life of so many physicians, and he's been doing this since actually he founded the clinic, the center EHCB in Dallas in 72 or 74, beginning yeah. multiple chemical sensitivity. Uh, and still today, people, a lot of doctors don't even believe in detox. You're, tell me, as a naturopath, your, your expertise is infections, right? I guess chemicals, uh, biological pollutants, uh, EMFs, that, that can make us more sensitive to infections as well? Um, actually, my specialty is environmental medicine. That's what I teach. So my specialty is my area, what I do for work, is teaching doctors, number one, how do we understand what people are exposed to? 
honestly, Andre, just teaching doctors how to take a good history, the appropriate history, the right history for environmental exposures is the key. Well, they should one. Read, they, I'm sorry, they should read Lynn Marshall of the Women's College yes. in Toronto. Women's College Hospital, she has a great article she wrote in the Canadian Medical Association Journal on taking a Yes, we use, we use Dr. Marshall's groundbreaking foundational research to, to help teach doctors about using appropriate questionnaires. So next, how do we then assess that information and figure out what to test for? That's the art. Uh, uh, that, that, uh, that we need to integrate with the skill of practicing environmental medicine. When we throw EMF, EMR exposures into the picture, it becomes a little bit more uh, strategic. You know, we have to add that extra piece in uh, because we're all exposed to that exposure. So then how do we go about the process of looking at those exposures and starting to um, decrease that full barrel, right? We have to teach our patients avoidance of the uh, about 200 toxicants we're exposed to, and this is work done by the Center for Disease uh, Control in the United States, their NHANES survey, chemicals in people uh, database. How do we go about reducing those everyday exposures? What is the remediation we need to teach our patients? That's crucial. You know, I'm, I am forever frustrated by doctors who uh, give their patients detox miracles, you know, those products, you know, the seven day detox, without even understanding what the exposures are that people need to avoid because they're just going to continue to expose themselves. Good for the doctors, right? They make lots of money continuing to treat people for long periods of time without ethically doing environmental medicine. One thing I found important is when Stephanie McCarter says some of the patients who arrive in Dallas at their center are so sick that they can't take any vitamins or supplements. They react to everything. Correct. Correct. They, they have lost uh, their capacity to differentiate um, uh, non-self, meaning what is not part of the human body, that's safe from not safe. Right. So as Bill Ray used to say, this loss of tolerance is a crucial step in the development of environmental illness. So these people are long past losing their tolerance. And, and so that the process of getting them well, and you'll see when you talk to Dr. McCarter, is a very specific process of helping them begin to detoxify in a, in a safe environment where there's some avoidance there, and slowly be able to tolerate inputs of nutrition and botanicals and some medications. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a specialty area for a reason. Environmental medicine is a specialty area for a reason. Many years oh, ago. Claudia Miller, yeah. Many years ago, I met Dr. John McLennan, who was uh, the pioneer in environmental medicine in Canada. They, I think he was in Toronto. And I asked him, what's the best book on this topic? And this was it by Ashford and Miller. I think mm -hmm. every health professional should read this book. Yes. The author, yes. Their credentials are yes. amazing. Ashford and Miller, professor uh, at, at MIT for Miller. Oh, yeah. Uh, Cla Claudia Miller is very um, well known in the field of environmental medicine for her work in doing intakes, you know, figuring out how to do uh, appropriate intakes in patients who have been environmentally exposed. We still use her, her intake uh, process. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to just get back to EMFs and EMRs for a second because um, what we are now experiencing, the rollout of the 5G frequency, yeah. mm -hmm. or mm, that's not really appropriate, but the rollout of the 5G band width, which is um, problematic in that it is a much higher frequency, is going to, and it's rolling out this month in the States. I don't know what's going on in Canada, but it's rolling out this month in the States. We have only going to pilots. Where? Montreal and Quebec City. 
uh, Ericsson and a number of companies across Canada, actually, but I know Montreal and Quebec City has begun. So we will be talking about the 5G rollout um, at the EMF conference, and we'll be talking specifically about what kinds of um, symptomology may be related to that, uh, as well as um, appropriate public policy that's needed to really reevaluate the safety of 5G. So I, I think we will have our colleagues from the EU who will be able to guide us in that. Um, as well, we're partnering, I should mention this as well, we're partnering with Cici Doucette and Theodora Scarato, two wonderful, highly effective um, consumer advocacy organizations. Uh, Cici Doucette uh, is in uh, wireless education and Theodora Scarato is the ED for Environmental Health Trust, two science-based organizations that that do research in this area. And uh, Dr. Deborah Davis, I don't know if you've interviewed her, but she's a PhD researcher who's written books on cell technology. She's going to be talking about some of the infertility-related research and some of the cancer-related research with EMFs and EMRs that she's doing globally. People don't like realize that. infertility is one of the main targets where the, the science is the most solid and really worrisome for a lot of countries absolutely yes. in both men and women i might add yeah. it's not just men it's women as well exactly tell me yeah. a bit about victoria dunkley so dr dunkley is a pediatric psychiatrist in los angeles california she works specifically with children as you might imagine being a pediatrician and she looks at both the effect of screen time on their uh, nervous system as well as their hormonal system. So she's looking at children, their exposure to screen time, their exposure to Wi-Fi, their exposure to cell phones, and how that puts them at greater risk for conditions like ADHD and ADD. And the, the uh, really hopeful thing Andre, about her work is that she's now working with many uh, pediatricians and psychologists to actually create uh, public policy around uh, schools as well as what's appropriate for the American Academy of Pediatrics to do when they're treating kids with ADHD and ADD who have an inordinate amount of screen time meaning that they're exposed to devices or are holding devices and, and being exposed to screens an inordinate amount of the day. So she's actually going to talk about some of her research looking at um, uh, resets, meaning taking kids away from devices for a little while, what happens to their brains when they're given the opportunity to reset. And, and you know, she's going to focus on schools uh, as well. We have another speaker focusing on schools too, but we're really, you know, schools are one of the places where high levels of Wi-Fi because of the necessity for having 25 or 35 kids in a classroom online, as well as the teacher, um, there, there's inordinate amounts of exposure to Wi-Fi in schools. Um, Dr. Jelter, who also uh, works with kids as well as with adults, uh, has done a tremendous amount of work in not only uh, recognizing this problem, but also treating it. She's going to be talking about some of the technology she uses to treat electrosensitivity. And she's here in California. And she recommends the two-week detox, really cutting out all the, the wireless for two weeks and has amazing results with kids with uh, autism, notably. Correct. Correct. It, it will not surprise you but it may surprise some of your listeners that uh, many physicians who treat autism who have their offices hardwired, meaning there's no Wi-Fi in the working environment, who have their buildings protected from external Wi-Fi, report that when the parents bring the autistic kids to the office, to that safe environment, and they're in that environment for a couple of hours, they the parents experience significant behavior changes in the autistic children that they have not seen before since the diagnosis. 
of spectrum disorder. I'm so excited about covering this conference because you have all the heavyweights, except a few like Dr. Hardell who were in Brussels, but one of the, one, probably the, the physician I'm quoting the most these days, where is she? Dr. Russell has done an amazing- uh, He should be done under the panel, public policy panel yeah. speaker. For 5G, she's really searched uh, this, this topic. Uh, yes. So she also, Andre, is going to be talking about exposure in schools, but I am sure, even though it's not in her bio, that she will be talking about the 5G rollout. Yeah. yeah. She uh, is part of the Santa Clara Medical Society. She's written extensively in their journal. You know, they have a little print journal. Um, she has excellent articles online about Wi-Fi. And, she, um, and wireless exposures. She's also the one who wrote the California Medical Association resolution on wireless. So Correct. This is something that physicians should also read. Really important. And they have this great she's website. Really, right. She's really, and I think it's also important. You know, she's a surgeon, and so she really, um, you know, she's going to be doing surgery no matter what. But her the uh, review of the science on this topic has led her to become an activist in this area, you know, as a medical professional because she's so um, convinced by the science on uh, detrimental uh, effects of wireless exposures. So yeah, she's going to be great. She, you know, she's going to speak uh, in the general session as well as being part of the panels. And then one last thing I want to direct you to is that's the public policy panel, but we're also, if you'll just scroll down a little, scroll down a little bit, I think. Um, we're also, oh, maybe it's not on there yet. You can, you can stop where uh, Peter Sullivan is, yeah. because we're gonna be having a panel in the evening to directly teach healthcare providers about the safe use of technology. So we're gonna be teaching them about remediation for home and office, with We're going to be teaching them. Um, Peter Serk is probably one of the leading bell biologists in the United States of America mm -hmm. in the area of EMF, EMR remediation. We're going to be teaching people how to hardwire their phones. We're going to be teaching people about uh, remediation for smart meters. And that will all be a hands-on panel with the hopes, as you can imagine, that uh, healthcare providers will become more active in creating safe workplaces for themselves and their coworkers. This will as be well on Saturday as, night, I believe, right? Eh? Yes, as well as safe home environments for themselves and their families. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, none of us are anti-technology, as you know. I couldn't exist without it. I can't imagine existing without it. But what I want, and I think what all of us want, is safe technology. Yeah. And we have that. We have, we have the understanding and the, the knowledge and the hardware and software to have safe technology now throughout the United States. It's very possible. I'm looking forward to meeting the EMF doc. Dr. Huser work with Hans Selye in Montreal, McGill. And you Can you believe it? Yes. The famous Dr. Hans Selye. Yeah. He's wonderful. Dr. Hauser, I've had the opportunity to... Uh, communicate with him several times. Um, the research that he's done really looking at diagnostic MRIs for electrosensitivity is pretty groundbreaking. And, you know, this was done at uh, the Brain Research Institute in UCLA, Andre. It, it wasn't done in his basement. <laughs> I mean, it was done in one of the most prestigious neurological research institutes in the world. So, I'm looking forward to challenging them as a devil's advocate because when people look at Dr. Huser's papers or Dr. Belpont's papers, they say, well, these symptoms are, are what you're measuring in blood and in, uh, in urine. It's not specific. There's no one single test for EHS, of course. There's no one single test for, for many medical conditions. True. True. We know this is medical providers, that uh, accurate diagnosis usually involves an assessment and a comprehensive evaluation of laboratory tests and, and um, appropriate scans. And so I, I don't think that 
that particular uh, criticism holds much water, honestly. It's the weight of evidence like with scientific research. It's not a single study that, but absolutely, we, we have to say, I don't know if you saw in microwave news very recently, the IARC experts, the International Agency for Research on, Council, on Cancer, which classified radio frequencies 2B, possibly carcinogenic, in 2011, the number and the weight of papers published since 2011 is so important that their experts in microwave news, there was an article recently saying, it's urgent that IR convenes its experts once again to review the data. And, Correct. But there's a lot of lobbying because after saying it's, it's urgent, they said that it, it should be, be from here, from 2022 to 2024, but what experts are, are expecting is that it'll be a 2A carcinogen, probably carcinogenic, or a class one carcinogen, as Dr. Hardell, Anthony Miller, and others are saying, all the top in, in event, independent experts. Right, right. And the reason that the, you know, that classification system is, is based on animal research, and that's the difficulty with it, is we feel pretty free to expose uh, many different kinds of species of animals to radio frequencies. Uh, we can't do the same for humans. So we, you know, whether we will ever be able to prove that it is a, a without a doubt, a human carcinogen without doing that human research, which of course we do not want to do, yeah. to, uh, you know, remains to be determined. But yes, absolutely, the, the overwhelming amount of research uh, both the Ramazzini Animal Studies and the National Toxicology Project uh, really point the finger at the carcinogenicity of radio frequencies, for sure. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say that it's a coincidence when the humans are developing the same types of tumors as the rats are. I mean, there's something to look at very seriously here. Well, and we also have case series of women who have developed multifocal breast tumors in the exact area where they have deposited their phones inside yeah. of their bras. And there, there, are, there are unfortunately um, increasing numbers of case series of these diagnoses. And the breast surgeons that are diagnosing these women are saying without any doubt, this is a result of exposure to the, the, uh, the emanation from the cell phone, you know, the linking of the cell phone to, to a frequency. So yeah, yeah, those, um, uh, there's good published, there's some published data on this. We, we did not invite the breast surgeons because we felt like Dr. Um, Davis could speak to that. She's done research in that area as well. But you can see that, uh, that there are several women who are, you know, on the other side of their diagnosis who have talked about, um, you know, the fact that they frequently stored their cell phones inside of their bras. And they actually, unfortunately, make a product now that's a bra with a pocket in it specifically for a cell phone. Oh, my God. I didn't hear about that. Yeah. Yeah. And those products really need to be removed from the market. So um, Generation Zapped, thank you for going to that. So we are working with the uh, producer of Generation Zap to be able to access this. We're asking all our doctors to watch it as their homework. Um, you know, in healthcare providers, they're very good students. They do their homework. So we'll all come with some, hopefully, the same basic level of understanding. Um, Dr. Belpalm is in this film. I know Dr. Johansson, Dr. Havas, who's also going to be speaking here, yes. as well as many of us are interviewed in this film. I, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing you there as well. And uh, I think one of the things I may have mentioned to you or not is we have worked very hard with this venue to turn off the Wi-Fi in the lecture hall, as well as the building in which the conference will be held. So uh, people will experience uh, some variants of a digital detox during the time they're there. Yeah. Uh, and, and this, I believe, is the first venue in the United States to be able to offer that. Uh, we, we did this of course, in good conscience, but also because we received many phone calls from physicians who said, I really need to come, I really want to come, but I can't come, I'm electrosensitive. I can't be in your lecture hall because of the exposure. So 
that really uh, kind of uh, flipped it for us. And we really worked hard with the venue to make this a Wi-Fi free conference. It's amazing. You're also in a redwood forest, I think, the, for the venue, right? Correct. This is actually a retreat center that serves 100% organic food in a redwood forest outside of Scotts Valley, California, which is outside of Santa Cruz. Yeah, it's a beautiful venue. I mean, it's just beautiful. Um, I stayed there and, you know, I'm electrosensitive myself and I was able to actually sleep pretty well. So that was, that was a good sign. How did you come, uh, when, when and how did you find out you were electrosensitive? Um, because I, uh, Dr. Lisa Naj uh, was teaching as a lecturer to our physicians in an environmental medicine class. And she started describing some of the symptomology of electrosensitivity, numbness and tingling in the fingertips when in contact with a, uh, um, a device, you know, and that can be a laptop, um, brain fog, um, uh, um, just difficulty concentrating, you know, and, and I started recognizing some of these symptoms uh, in myself and tinnitus, you know, ringing in the ears. After hardwiring my home and making sure that my workplace was also hardwired, my tinnitus completely went away. Uh, and so did most of the other uh, symptoms, but I still prefer not to sleep in an environment where there's uh, uh, EMS. That reminds EMS. me of, of something, you know, often when I give talks or whatever about EHS, people say, well, I, I'm not electrosensitive. I don't react. To, it doesn't concern me. And I saw a paper recently where it can take many years where people are in denial. One, that we're all electric. We're all electrosensitive, but as Dr. Belpont says, we lose tolerance. And the minute exactly. this tingling or the ear warming up, you're becoming electrosensitive, hypersensitive. Right. So and when Dr. When Dr. Nash, yes, and when Dr. Nash talked about that, I had a memory, Andre, that uh, probably years before, I had to stop holding my phone to my ear many years before because it would feel uh, slightly, dis there was a discomfort there that was uh, accompanied by warmth that did not feel good. So I had stopped holding my phone and started using speakerphone many years before, but, but yeah, we just, um, we don't have the knowledge, nor do we have the awareness to be able to recognize those prodromal symptoms, absolutely. There's this French uh, scientist, I think he's an engineer or a psychi uh, psychologist, who's done work on the nocebo effect. And he said that we know it's not the nocebo. People are not reacting because they're afraid of microwaves because most people have never heard of those risks. And they take it. his latest study, uh, I don't have uh, this one here, but what he found is that the minute people start connecting the dots between their symptoms and EMFs, they take a long time before changing their behavior because they're saying, oh my God, my whole life is going to be upside down. I won't be able to go out with my friends anymore. And that's what happens when people wait too long and get too sick. They lose their social life or lose their friends, their family. It's really horrible, eh? Well, what, what you're going to find out uh, from Dr. McCarter and Dr. Naj is that it is possible to recover from electrosensitivity uh, to the degree that you, you're, you're not isolated socially or culturally, but you understand enough about exposure to not expose yourself unnecessarily. No. And so that means all the things that you, I'm sure, already know about the use of devices and time spent in areas where there is a high density of Wi-Fi signal. And that, that is, you know, part of what we learn to do is really uh, take care of ourselves, which we all need to do. It's a necessity living in the 2000s in, in, on the planet Earth right now. Yeah. And so, yes, I'm also... Oh, and I have one important thing to say about uh, Dr. McCarter before we end. So what Dr. Ray developed in his clinic that Dr. McCarter um, uses at EHC Dallas is a room that is a clean room, meaning it has no other exposures. 
into which a patient can go and be exposed to different levels of frequency. Now they're hooked up to a EEG and several other uh, uh, barometers basically of physiologic reactions. And so the patient doesn't know when and what they're being exposed to. Mm -hmm. And this is actually a diagnostic procedure to, to uh, very clearly uh, looking at autonomic uh, nervous system um, reaction uh, as well as other uh, parameters be able to um, document exposure reactions to EMF CMRs. It's and the only Dr. one in the world. Dr. Ray explained to me that it, it takes three, four days to calm the nervous system before he, can ch he could challenge uh, patients with chemicals or, or, or radiation. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And so I think his pioneering work in this area really is leading us to understanding that, yes, you know, this is not psychosomatic. It's chemical and biochemical. <clears throat> and that there are very, you know, Bill was a very hard scientist. He was a cardiothoracic surgeon. He was very schooled in the art of reproducibility and validation. And so he has worked very hard to create tools that are reproducible and that are validated to be able to uh, diagnose and treat chemical and electromagnetic and um, electroradiation uh, based exposures. So yes, I think it's going to be a game changer for sure. I really do. Well, thanks very much, Lynn, for taking the time today. I know you're very busy, but I'm really excited. And I hope a lot of health professionals from Canada, from Europe, will come down to Santa Cruz, Scotts Valley, September 6th to 8th. And I'm uh, really looking forward to meeting all of you. It, it will still be nice summer weather there, just in case yeah. that matters. <laughs> oh, yeah. I want to have my first dip in the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> oh, good. Well, that, that'll be exciting to watch. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. My pleasure. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye now. Okay.